Hi, for Creaky Joints and the Global Healthy Living Foundation, I'm Seth Ginsberg, welcoming you to another in our educational and advocacy video series, A Guide to RA. We listen carefully to your needs, and we've compiled some experts to talk about issues you want to hear about. The first is Dr. Lori Ferguson, all about managing the frustration of living with rheumatoid arthritis. Then you'll hear from our in-house internet expert, Marco, all about engaging others, using social media, and amplifying your voice with the internet. And lastly, we're gonna cover off on advocacy, awakening the advocate in you, things you can do to improve your quality of life and hopefully the lives of others living with RA. So all of us at Creaky Joints have thought hard about the things you wanna learn about, which is why we've brought together world-renowned experts to talk about these subjects. Sit back, relax, enjoy the video, and think about what you can do to live better with RA. Hi, I'm Dr. Laurie Ferguson. I'm a health psychologist and I work with Creaky Joints, which is a part of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. This segment of the DVD is about dealing with frustration. Frustration, you know, that sense of being thwarted or being stopped, and it leads to discouragement and a sense of defeat. When you live with a chronic illness, frustration can be a constant companion. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to deal with frustration. What are some of the ways you can manage your frustration? We're going to talk about three different tactics. One is a, a kind of a physical tactic, how you deal with it in your body. Then we're going to talk about acceptance versus resistance, which can be a little controversial for some people. And then we're going to talk about how you tell your story, how you deal with that sense of internal frustration. So first, we start with physical. You know that when your frustration mounts, there are usually some symptoms or signs that you feel in your body. You get a headache. You realize you're clenching your jaw or clenching your teeth. Your stomach feels tight. For some of us, we feel a tightness in our chest. Maybe our heart races a little bit. We get that feeling that something is going on. And so if we notice it, how do we address it? I got a great book for Christmas. It's called The Age of Empathy, and it's written by a biologist who deals with primates, with chimps. And he does a lot of research, and he tells this great story in the beginning of the book about the chimp camp that they had in a very large enclosure and how they wanted to create a better structure for them to climb on and have fun with. So they took the chimps out of the enclosure and put them in separate cages, some of them even in separate buildings, and they began to build this big sort of Taj Mahal kind of, it was a toy really, but it was about three stories high for them to jump and climb and touch wood and have a great experience. It took about 10 days for them to put in all the posts and create this and the whole group gathered around, around 30 people to watch the chimps as they came out that first day to experience it. They were so excited to show it off to the chimps. He said one of the things they hadn't paid attention to was the fact that the chimps had been separated from each other for 10 days. And so when they came back into the enclosure, the first thing they wanted to do was jump in each other's arms and hug each other and kiss each other. And then they did all their posturing and their rolling around on the grass. They completely ignored the Taj Mahal. Then they lolled on the grass, they ate some bananas, they kind of hung out together, just glad to be together. And the next thing they did was go back over to the metal jungle gym that had been there for as long as the chimps had lived there. They went to the most simple thing first as they began to get reacquainted with what it was to be out and be together. I tell you that story because one of the things that sometimes we do, especially when we're trying to figure out how to deal with a problem, is we go towards the big or the fancy or the new. And what we need to do is start with the most simple, the most basic and obvious, the things we sometimes forget. So. One of the things those researchers forgot was the importance of, for those chimps of their social connection and that they loved what they already had. So we're going to start today with the most simple and the most basic. And that is that when we start to feel that sense of tension rising, of frustration in our jaw, we can hear it in our voice, we can feel it in our body, the first and most simple thing we can do is attend to how we're breathing. 
So I invited a colleague of mine here today, Alexi Salamaka. He's a certified yoga teacher, and I asked him to teach us some basic techniques for breathing that would relax and help deal with frustration. Well, thank you for being willing to come and teach us about breath and letting go of frustration. Of course. The breathing technique we are going to learn today is called complete breath or three-part breath. This simple but very efficient breathing technique is designed to give the mind something to focus on while you calm the central nervous system and lower blood pressure. Complete breath is a basic three-part breath that engages all parts of the lungs and the focus of the mind so that the body and thoughts can both get the rest they deserve. Before we begin, find a comfortable seated position and have your feet flat on the floor. Lengthen your spine up lifting the chest and opening the heart to the sky and roll the shoulders a few times up and down and then slowly relax the shoulders down allowing the shoulder blades to go down and back towards your sacrum allow your palms to rest on the knees relax the arms have your chin parallel to the floor and slowly close the eyes have your face soft soften your lower jaw Relax the eyes, eyebrows, spot between the eyebrows. Breathe naturally in and out through your nose. And as you sit comfortable, gradually allow the breath to happen as low as you can in the belly. When you inhale, inhale deeply all the way into your stomach. Soften the belly and feel the belly rise when you inhale. And then slowly draw the belly in when you in exhale. Take a few more rounds of breath here. And then on the next breath in, take a big deep inhale into your belly, letting the air rise up higher so the ribs expand outward. Then exhale ribs, exhale belly, breathing from the bottom up. Inhale, soften the belly, let the air in, expand the rib cage, and then exhale, let go. Reverse the breath and let it go. With the next breath in, we are going to continue and let the belly fill with air. Let the ribs expand outward and inhale a little bit more, letting the collarbones rise up and widen. And then exhale, squeeze the air out, empty the lungs. Continue your three-step breath, inhaling and exhaling through the nose while keeping your spine straight, your face relaxed, your arms soft, your palms resting on the knees. This is a great breath to activate the parasympathetic nervous system because it calms the mind. It brings fresh oxygen to your blood. It releases tension in the chest and abdomen and it also provides a gentle massage to abdominal organs, improving digestion. You can continue with this simple breath for as long as you'd like, and when you're ready to let it go, relax and resume your normal breath. Allow your breath to be a simple, natural inhale and exhale. Slowly open the eyes. Take a moment to notice how the body feels any emotions, thoughts, sensation that came up from this experience. Take a moment to acknowledge this, let it go, and relax. Thank you, Alexi. That was wonderful. Thank you, Lori. That was a great breathing technique, and part of the trick is to remember to do it. When you, those symptoms start, when you start to feel tense or clenching, or you realize some people even talk about their blood boiling when they get frustrated and feel right up against it. So to come back and to remember that you can do that simple physical practice. And the more you practice it, of course, the more effective it is. And there's some other things you can do as well that are physical. A very simple thing is get up and leave the room. If you've been on the phone with the insurance company and you can feel that frustration mounting that it's not working out, when you get off the phone, get up, go outside, take a breath, allow your body to just kind of let it go. If you've been upset about something, stand up and go into another room. Changing your space 
can also let frustration go. Another thing you can do that's very simple is call somebody that you care about who cares about you. Remember those chimps, how excited they were to see each other. We sometimes let social support or that feeling that others are there for us at networking, we ignore it or we don't use it in the way that we can. That can also help just turn down the volume on frustration. Some people meditate. Some people listen to music. Find the practices that are best for you, the physical practices that help you let frustration go. You have enough to deal with living with your illness. So this is something that you can begin to add to your set of tools to manage. And I know it'll work for you. In the introduction to this video, I said that we were also going to talk about acceptance versus resistance as something that's a part of frustration. And I said it was controversial because sometimes people who've been diagnosed say, I don't want to accept my disease. That's like giving into it. And I'm not going to give into it. It's better if I fight it, if I don't lie down and just take it. A slogan that I learned a while ago is what we resist persists. And I've often seen that when we bring that resistance sort of up against it energy, there will be an ongoing sense of frustration. And so I encourage people to think about acceptance, not as a giving into it, not as a submitting and giving up, but as an active energy that allows space for yourself. I think about this in terms of a person that I worked with. She had been an avid hiker and an outs, a lover of the out of doors. And with her diagnosis of RA came fatigue and pain. And a lot of that outdoor activity had to go by the wayside. She was frustrated to say the least. She felt that discouragement and some sense of defeat. What I encouraged her to do was to begin to observe herself when she had these feelings or these thoughts. Not to join with them and become them, but to simply see that part of her was grieving, part of her was angry, part of her was sad, and all of that came into that bundle we call frustration. To simply observe it, to not have to fix it, to not try to suppress it, but to allow it to be. That's a challenging thing to do. She began to practice that, and as she practiced it, I then encouraged her to then bring some empathy towards that part of herself that was frustrated. That kind of compassionate understanding that, yes, this is difficult. This is hard. This can be emotionally painful, not just physically painful. Again, that was a practice to simply bear witness to herself, not to have to try to make it better. As she began to do that, to bring that empathy, to bring that sense of bearing witness, to simply accepting where she was and how she felt, that kind of realistic assessment of herself with that sense of empathy, she began to find that she had some space, some inner space. And in that inner space, she began to feel a little more emotionally flexible, which is a great way to come into your life, not to have to have it be a certain way or else. In that flexibility, she found that sometimes she could get engaged, sometimes something was hard, and she could back off. She could take a moment, pause, and begin again from a different place. That flexibility began to be part of the way that she managed her life, that she managed her illness, and that she managed herself. That flexibility was great to begin to deal with frustration because she didn't always have to do everything the same way. As someone said, sometimes one thing works and sometimes another thing works. So as you cultivate that sense of acceptance, which creates room for you to be, and as you observe yourself and bring empathy to it, in that space, you then begin to be a little more emotionally or psychologically flexible. And that allows you to deal with and often let go of or move through your frustrations much more quickly. 
The last way I want to talk about frustration is by focusing on the kind of frustration that comes to us, not because of external circumstances, but because of our internal sense of self, our beliefs, our thoughts that can become limiting. Often we say, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that. Or we believe that. We say, it isn't fair. It isn't right. I don't want it to be like this. All of those thoughts and all of those beliefs that they turn into begin to accrue over time as the story we are telling about our life. And the more we tell our story that way, the more that becomes our life. And it can be very limiting. There's a story told in Northern Thailand about a monastery where the monks had a very large but somewhat ordinary statue of the Buddha. It was a terracotta statue. It was a part of their worship. People came to see it, and when they visited the monastery, it was something they simply took care of. During a particularly dry season, the monks began to notice that there were some very large cracks going up the clay, and they began to worry that the entire statue was going to break open. One of the monks found a light and went over towards the cracks to try to get a sense of how deep it went. And as he began to shine the light into the crack, he noticed something glinting underneath. They took the light and looked in all the cracks, and as they saw this glinting glow, they began to realize that underneath the terracotta Buddha was something much different. They began to take hammers and crack it open. And what they found was astounding, an enormous golden Buddha statue, precious, magnificent, and beautiful. They realized that what had happened was many, many, many years ago, the monks had covered it up with clay in order to protect it so that it wouldn't be stolen or taken. I think about our lives where we often do the same thing. Our beliefs and our thoughts that limit us cover up our deep nature, our true self. And sometimes to tell the story of our lives without frustration, we need to go to a much deeper place, to notice who we are underneath all of that, and to begin to tell our story from that place. That's a place where you are free, where you are whole, where your life is meaningful. How we tell our story begins to be the life we live. And we get to choose every day how we talk about ourselves, how we talk about who we are. And so think about the choices that you are making. Allow yourself to tell your story from a very deep place, from that golden place. Recognize the treasures that you have. We've talked about three things that you can do. One is the physical practices, that breath, getting out of the room, calling somebody, the practices you can use physically to manage the frustrations that come along. We talked about acceptance and resistance, and that the practice of acceptance can create some room and some flexibility for you so that you can try one thing or another. And finally, we talked about the way you are telling your story to yourself to deal with some of that internal sense of frustration. How can you begin to tell your story and challenge some of your beliefs? Get a sense of what your golden or true life might be about for you. All three of these offer practices for you to deal with the frustration that comes from living with chronic illness. We believe that you can do it. You can manage these frustrations and you can get some help and some support for you to do it. Thank you for being part of it. Hello, my name is Marco Patel Vasquez and I manage the social media for creakyjoints.org. Although social media may be a term you've been hearing tossed around every day, you may still ask yourself, what exactly is social media, and why should I get involved? 
Social media is used to describe the use of technology and the internet for social interaction. Have you ever used one of these websites? Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Creaky Joints, or Blogger? If you have, then you've already been engaging in social media. Social media gives you instant access to relevant and timely information, and it can be accessed from a variety of channels. Through modern technology, we are able to stay connected whenever and wherever we are. Today, I'll be discussing the benefit of actively engaging yourself in social media. I will introduce you to some common websites that rely on user-generated content. Facebook is the world's largest and most popular social networking website. With over 500 million active users, there's a chance that you already have a Facebook account. In any given day, 50% of all active Facebook users log on, spending over 700 billion minutes per month on Facebook worldwide. The user is able to share content, such as web links, news stories, blog posts, notes, photo albums, and much more. In addition to adding friends and sharing content with them, you can also find health-related organizations with fan pages on Facebook. Simply search for an organization, like Creaky Joints, in the search box. Click on it and hit the like button. Liking this page allows you to interact and get the latest updates from Creaky Joints right on your main newsfeed. Twitter is another increasingly popular tool for social media. There are more than 106 million accounts on Twitter and the number of users on Twitter increases by 300,000 every day. Twitter is an open platform from which you can easily spread a message or send other people messages around the world in 140 characters or fewer. It's fast, timely, and designed to be concise. You can share your thoughts, questions, opinions, and photos. And if you choose, you can also be a casual observer on Twitter, simply using it as a platform to follow people and organizations that interest you. Before you dive into Twitter, it is important that you understand some of the Twitter jargon. Tweet. A tweet is a message posted via Twitter. It must be 140 characters or fewer. Follow. To follow someone on Twitter means to subscribe to their tweets or updates on the site. Other users can also follow you. Let's follow Creaky Joints. Mention. You can mention another user in your tweet by including the at symbol followed directly by their username. This also refers to tweets in which your username was included. A retweet is a tweet by another user forwarded to you by someone you follow. Often used to spread news or share valuable findings on Twitter, you can also retweet other people's messages to all of your followers. Direct message. A direct message is a private tweet that is only visible between the sender and the recipient. Tweets become direct messages when they begin with the letter D and the username to specify who the message is for. Hashtag. Users often prepend the pound symbol to words in their tweets to categorize them for other users to search easily. YouTube gives you a place to simply upload your thoughts into a video and share it with the online community. You are able to easily navigate through their website and post video just by using your webcam. Videos can make a big impact in social media, allowing a viewer to have more of an intimate feel when they're able to put a face to the person sharing their thoughts and experiences. Message boards are another way to interact with others by posting topics, questions, and other conversations. There are many times when patients are unable to locate relevant information pertaining to their condition. Message boards, like Creaky Joints, are more specialized in the sense that they are a community focused on a common interest. Most blogs are interactive and allow readers to leave comments and keep up to date with the writer's latest entry. You can create your own blog to follow your life and experiences too on various blogging platforms. Here are some steps you should follow to get started blogging. Choose a blog host. Determine what your blog will be about. Choose a name for your blog. Be creative. Decide if you want to be public or private. Choose your template or layout. Write a few posts. Check it out. Publish your blog by sending the address to your friends. 
Engaging with other bloggers will increase your chances of getting your own blog noticed. Some popular blogging websites include WordPress, Blogger, and Tumblr. There are many ways to engage yourself in social media, but it is extremely important to stay safe while interacting online. Choose your screen name and password carefully, and never share your password with anyone. Social media is changing fast, and as it continues to evolve, make sure you have fun with it, and most importantly, connect with others. Get started today! Now, let's awaken the advocate in you. You do have something to say about how you'll live with your chronic disease. In fact, sometimes you're the only one who can speak up about the policies that determine what your quality of life will be. For many years, patients were the passive partner in their disease treatment. Somebody else always knew better. This passivity allowed two changes to take place. First, some people and companies charged with the responsibility of helping you get better, or at least cope with the symptoms of a chronic disease, realize they could, at your expense, make money from your condition. Others took advantage of patient passivity by delivering less than excellent care. These situations are not universally true. There are many people and companies who participate in your healthcare delivery who want you to get well, cope successfully with your chronic disease, and live a very fulfilling life. Your job is to recognize your role in getting better, and that includes speaking out so that the few people who aren't focused on achieving excellence in treatment and the few companies that only want to make money from your condition are called out. You have three natural allies in advocacy. Organizations like Creaky Joints and its parent company, the Global Healthy Living Foundation, the media, and your elected representatives at the local, state, and federal level. The media and politicians can be very intimidating. Creaky Joints and the Global Healthy Living Foundation aren't. Through our Patient Advocacy Institute, we can help you successfully communicate with the media and politicians, but there's also much you can do. Create your healthcare team. This starts with a doctor you like, a doctor who understands how you define treatment success, a doctor who listens and a doctor who then helps. The next team member is the person in the doctor's office who deals with your health insurance company. Make sure this person is your best friend. Send them a birthday card if you need to. You'll have problems at some point and you need someone who knows what to do in that office. This should take care of the medical side of your life. You're a much better advocate if you're getting the medication you need from a physician you like and a physician you respect. Now you can get to know the people who are making decisions about your quality of life, politicians. Healthcare is in transition today in the United States. You need to think about your needs and communicate these to your politician. If you've ever talked with your representative before, you know it's a fairly easy thing to do, making your opinion heard. But it can be difficult to translate that talk into action that benefits you and the others like you. So before you talk, ask. A simple phone call with a set of simple questions will tell you whether your representative is a patient-centered person or not. If she's not, or if he's not, make your point, but don't expect any results. Find another politician who represents you who is more sympathetic to your situation. Creaky Joints can help with this. We educate politicians at all levels in all states. You and Creaky Joints can become a very powerful team that combines our experience with your voting power. What I'm really trying to say here is that communicating with a politician isn't difficult. In fact, it could be very energizing. A productive conversation with a politician or a staffer who understands your problems can give you the energy you need to keep going. When you find a cooperative person, take the opportunity to ask questions. Don't think you have to be the person who has to have all the answers. Ask who else can help you. Ask what you can do to help the politician more effectively get your feelings heard and understood by other politicians or by the companies that are lobbying that politician. 
You might be asked to come in and speak in person or before a committee. If you are, do it. Or let us know and we'll help you prepare or find someone else if speaking before politicians isn't something you like to do. There may be bills you can support by writing a letter and getting your friends to write a letter. If there aren't bills to support, suggest that that politician introduce one. The point is that you want to try to create a relationship that extends beyond that first phone call. You want to be the person the politician wants to talk with. So what about the media? Well, the media can be a lot tougher. You don't vote for the media, so they have no reason to talk with you unless what you have to say will make them money. At the Global Healthy Living Foundation and Creaky Joints, we don't mean to be cynical about this, but the fact is that unless the reporter and editor think your story will appeal to the readers and viewers and help sell advertising which will ensure that their paychecks don't bounce, you're not likely to get a very positive response. This is especially true of television news. We deal with the media every day. Pitching a story can be very difficult, but not impossible. We can help, but you can help too. Unless you live in a very small town, be prepared to get frustrated when you contact the media. Often, the combination of creaky joints and you can result in the media paying attention to your specific situation. But you don't have to be frustrated by conventional television, radio, or newspapers because you can reach the people who care through the internet. Blogs, discussion boards, and comments on existing stories is a great way to speak up and feel good about getting your story out there. It'll amplify your voice tremendously. The only caution is to please remember that forums will be around forever, just one search away. So please be thoughtful and careful about what you write. If you find yourself in an argument with a person on the internet, put down your mouse and back away from your keyboard. You want to feel good when you speak out on the internet, not angry. We can help you become a great blogger by promoting you on one or all of our websites and helping you find other places that let even more people know about your advocacy position. Check out our current bloggers on Creaky Joints or our other sites as, such as redpatch.org for psoriasis or creakybones.org for osteoporosis. We'd like to find a place for you on one or all of these sites so you can amplify your voice and talk with all of our 44,000 members. At Creaky Joints, we think every patient and every caregiver has a voice that needs to be heard. It's too easy to think you have no power when actually you, as a patient or caregiver, have tremendous power when it's focused on the right audience. But advocacy is also about making sure your voice is heard by the right people at the right time. We hope all the messages in today's video has inspired you to become a better patient. There are lots of people out there and they all want to hear from you. Because don't forget, whether it's the healthcare professionals, the politicians, or even members of the media, everyone is subject to a chronic illness. And if it's not them personally, it's someone in their family. So our health is very personal to all of us as a society. Take these messages, use these pointers, and be the advocate you need to be.